to actually give a talk on this uh, on this topic. Uh, let me give my little bit uh, background before I start uh, this talk. I actually trained at uh, John Hopkins University in Maryland, and I started just like everyone started in radiation oncology. And after my training, I started the radio surgery over there and then become a fa faculty there for about five years. Then I moved in 2003 to Georgetown University Hospital, Washington, DC. There we have uh, uh, conventional radiotherapy, I mean, LENAC accelerators, brachytherapy, and we have two cyber knives. So the, those cyber knives are under the stereotactic radio surgery, as well as based radio surgery. So in 2017, we started this proton therapy. We have a very unique machine, which is the first time in Georgetown University, our first time in the, in the proton. The machine is Mavian machine. They started with the, uh, they called the, adjustable aperture, just like MLC on the other machine. So there is no other machine at this moment have that opportunity. So we can actually shape the beam of our, as we shape the beam with the conventional MLC. Okay, so I will go over a little bit in the end of this talk to about the Mavian machine. But this talk is generally actually um, talk about the use of the proton beam in in the clinical aspects, how we are using. Because last, uh, I think two weeks ago, Dr. Abrar gave a very good talk about the charged particles and he touched on the proton as well. So he gave a talk on the basics of the proton machines and whatever is available. Uh, so I will not actually touch those things, but a little bit I will give you an introduction. So maybe the, the, the audience who were actually absent at that time, so they can have some flavor of the proton. Okay, so you may actually ask any question in between the talk, there is no issue. So let's start with the proton beam radiotherapy. So in 2007 in uh, New York time, they actually gave a very good article on the front page. They said that the hospitals chase a nuclear tool to fight cancer. You know that uh, before that, the, the proton, clinical proton, it started in 1990. There are two centers. One is Loma Linda in California, and one center is in Boston, Massachusetts. They started in 1990. Actually, the proton treatments. But the proton is using for the patient treatment from 1954 in Berkeley and here and there. And there is a lot of research work going on, but no one actually actually putting the aspect of the clinical as actually this, this field start booming around 2005, 2006. Still, uh, except the Massachusetts, no one is doing the radio surgery with this proton. Everyone is doing the conventional way of the treatment because there is a lot of biological effects which needs to be calculated or which needs to be uh, clinically or uh, do a, need a lot of research on that. But now as the experience is going on and there is data is available, the people started actually looking what is available and what how they can adjust or escalate the dose based on the experience. So before that the proton are using for the research purpose, those called the nuclear particle accelerators. There are a lot of accelerators available and there was available at that time and, and for many years and the particle physics and high energy physics are using those accelerators like Sun in Switzerland, a lot of actually accelerators in UK and Germany and there is some are in Japan as well. So there, there were not Though those accelerators are not using for the clinical purpose, but they are using for the nuclear purpose or the other research or industrial purpose as well. But anyway, going forward, I recommend all of uh, the new users are just for the education purpose. So these are the two actually references which I recommend. 
the one is the radiation oncology physicist uh, i view by michael gotin and the other one is proton and charge particle radiotherapy by thomas delany and any cool those two books are very basic books and it, it, it will give you a very good flavor the dosimetry point of view as well as the physics point of view okay let's start that so i will try to cover the topics there will be a little bit uh, longer talk today there is rational for the proton therapy basic physics of proton radiation therapy proton accelerators proton treatment techniques treatment planning uncertainties treatment at georgetown university hospital and some quality assurance so first couple of topics i will just give an uh, um, i i i bored on that the reason is because you already uh, had a talk uh, from dr abrar this is a very famous uh, picture you will see everyone is showing whoever is using the proton there is a comparison between the proton and photon i am actually a good user of photon as well i am not actually saying that um, photon or proton giving a privilege or giving a preference um, one of the other but this is just for the education purpose so is a motivational purpose that why we are using the proton where is the proton is actually benefited to the patient as compared to the photon if you see on the right side uh, of the screen there is a photon treatment uh, this is a very good uh, craniospinal radiation so you see uh, there is a lot of exit dose on this side of the of the patient and those cranio craniospinal radiations to the peds patients and peds are uh, the the radiation effect actually is a very longer effect so you uh, if the patient is old patient you may not see a effect in 5 years maybe 10 years there is a radiation effect but the peds are is a longer life and uh, they will they will see if there is any radiation effect in their life uh, when they are growing but if you use a proton there is no exit dose so the normal structures are easily uh, constrained this is another example using the prostate prostate x rays photon as well as the proton so the proton use only the the two beams uh, two beams which are actually very conformal beam on from both laterals whereas you see the photons which are uh, giving the dose to the uh, normal structures as well third one is the proton stop as you know the range is basically the energy and tissue dependent so when is enter into the tissue so it stop at certain time so usually usually the range is from 50 to 250 mev so the the range exponentially decrease when the photon when the proton actually go into the tissue and it departed all the energy so then the, the the next one is they deposit a lot of dose where the where they stop that's why it's called the bragg peak it was discovered by the bragg then another uh, a good good of the proton therapy is dose falls off sharply both laterally and distally so the modern therapy is showing where we are right now and where we are going let's see that so the basic physics of proton let's take some actually look into it to review some of the basics of the proton and proton therapy before we dig into the specifics of the advanced scanning beams as you know that the proton everyone has a physics like uh, proton 101 cases or the physics 101 courses in in your uh, college or universities early universities so you know that what is the proton proton is a positively charged particle have a large resting mass encompassed by the coulomb field coulomb field is the electrostatic field around an electrically charged particle or body protons always interact with electrons or nuclei of atoms in matter no significant significant deflection of protons off their path travel in a fairly straight line that's the beauty of this this is the advantage in using in the clinic each interaction is generally a very small amount of each particle kinetic energy loss the protons are continuously slowing down until the proton eventually stop completely in the previous talk uh, someone asked from dr abrar how we get the bragg peak so the stopping power is the main which actually give the bragg peak 
energy loss per unit mass uh, path length. So stopping power increases as a proton slow down. Due to this reason, a proton losses a large amount of its energy immediately before the particles come to rest. This creates a dose deposition peak at the end of the proton range. So how we define the stopping power? Because stopping power is very important in the proton therapy. Uh, as we go down on the, on, the, on the talk, you will see that how the stopping power is playing a role. So stopping power is basically the rate of energy loss per unit of pass length. For example, if there is a charged particle of any type having a kinetic energy of T, traveling in a medium of atomic number, any number, high number Z, so the units are million electron volt per cm or joule per meter. Next important topic to understand the proton is the range. The expected value of the path length that a particle follows until it comes to rest in a specific medium. Factors, first, first one is the particle type, which particle type we are using. Then the initial direction, which direction the particle is going. Medium is traveling through, initial energy. The initial energy of proton particles dictates how far they will travel in a given medium. This is a very famous obligatory proton presentation Bragg peak. You know that this, this is the uh, X is the, sorry, lab depth and the relative dose. So, so the dose is actually very minimal uh, and it deposit all the energy at the end where it stops. So that's the, that's the Bragg peak which we are using in the clinic. So if you see, this is a Bragg peak of common proton therapeutic ranges from very zero to 450 millimeters in depth and different energies, right? So uh, there is a there is an energy from 90 MeV to 250 MeV. You see the depth in the in the in the medium is depth in the medium is varies based on the energy. If the energy is high, it will go into the deep. If the energy is low, it will actually um, deposit the energy at a shallow depth. So for example, if we are treating any CTV or any tumor, so it means that uh, the, we need to have energy which will cover the distal part of the tumor. So the, for example, if we are delivering a proton, so the proton should drop the maximum energy at the distal part first. So we will go over how we can treat this kind of CTV. So if we are using a very only a single Bragg peak, which is cover a small clinically insignificant area, to overcome this, what we do, we use a multiple Bragg peaks of varying energies and weighting can be combined. This summation of Bragg peak creates an area of uniformed prescribed radiation dose that is greater than or equal to the size of the target volume. This effect, this specific effect is known as the spread out Bragg peak, SOBP. So you will, if you are in the proton field, you will actually see this word a lot, SOBP. So for example, if you look at the proton beam uh, uh, PDD as compared to the photon PDD. So the photon PDD is giving a maximum dose at the uh, initially, and then it actually go down uh, we, uh, in the in the in the in the energy, but as it goes to the depth, but the proton uh, is going low first and then it drops the field. So, for example, the proton beam have the potential for higher dose conformity compared with the photon beams with less normal tissue radiation for both proximal and distal region. This is because the, that proton beams have a unique physical characteristics of Bragg peak. As shown in this figure, the depth dose in water for photon, proton and spread out Bragg peak, okay? So the Bragg peak is tissue enables the highest dose in the tumor. So what we do, we actually change the energy and cover that tumor, okay? So the, there is a controversy as well. So that says that the MRT or VMAT is a comparable range uncertainties. 
uh, the initial biological model and high cost. That's true. That's absolutely true. I'm not actually uh, saying that one, one treatment option or one modality is better than the other modality. This is just for an education talk. I would like to actually give the, what is the advantages of the proton over photon. It's just a motivational talk. There is no, no debate on this one. So there are a lot uh, of facilities all over. Dr. The Rashid. Yes, please. Uh, so yeah, yeah, related to your current discussion now, can I put it the question in the same? Yeah, so yeah. as the proton therapy is there for a long time, you know, I mean, is there any randomized trial which is indicated that the proton therapy is, you know, the superior than the other modality, treatment modalities in terms of yeah. the, the disease-free survival, or it is just good in terms of late in the, the, the RD effects? No, yeah, there is a lot of actually random trials are uh, going on right now. Okay, so it's not, the data is, uh, you know that uh, from last uh, five, six years, so this, uh, this modality is booming, right? So there is a lot of data available. Before that data were not that available. So there are a lot of random, randomized trials are going on. So you will see in a very near uh, future. So some data are available for the, for the lung treatments and prostate treatments, okay. So our center is also doing one randomized trial on the, on the lung, okay. And then there is also uh, about uh, seven or eight months ago, so there is a random, randomized trial started on GI. Okay. So with the advantage of the photon therapy, for example, cyber knife or radio surgery or, uh, or SBRT, we can say. So there is a lot of advantage to the GI patient, but even though the GI survival rate is only two to three years, okay which is not that bad as compared to the older conventional treatments. But there is a lot of actually uh, trials are going on and our center is started, start, started a trial as well on the survival for the GI patients. So you will see in the very near future, there is a lot of uh, trials. Still, there is an issue with the RBE. I will touch base with the RBE in the end of this talk. So there is a uncertainty still in the proton. All right, should I, thanks. Uh, should I give the answer? Yes, 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 thanks. So there are uh, more than, um, this is an old, uh, which is saying 2017, but I can say in 2017, there are 175,000 patients were treated all over the world. So as we talk that there is a broad, broad, broad peak uh, so we need to actually cover the CTV. So how the CTV is covered by changing the, the proton energy in order to cover that, uh, the CTV. So the protons, as you know, how they, they interact with the, with, the, with the matter. So the protons are charged particle. So it has the energy from 250 to 70 MeV. So the range in the tissue is varies from 37 to 4 cm. So I put in the table, which can actually 250 to 237 uh, cm in the range and uh, the, la the low energy, which is uh, available in the proton is 70 MeV that can, can actually go into four centimeters. So we can use the range in between in order to cover the tumor. So there is an inelastic, I will not go in details about this. Uh, there is a lot of physics behind it for the how we can get those uh, collisions and how the energy is transferred uh, to the to the to the tissue. But in elastic and elastic collisions, and you know then atomic uh, electrons and nuclei, and then inelastic nuclear interaction. As you know, the particle uh, the the proton is eighteen thirty five times more mass than the electron. There is this, um, that's why there is a less scatter as compared to the other photon or the electrons. Let's look into a very shallow way to the proton accelerators. As we know that the, there are proton accelerators are used in the clinic nowadays. One is the cyclotron, synchrotrons. These are the two one which are mainly used. For the cyclotron, <clears throat> it will give a continuous beam all protons have fixed energy. 
high current and compact. Whereas the synchrotron, there's a pulse beam, proton have a variable energy, low current and is a large impact. And there's a new which is combining with the synchro and the cyclotron is called the synchro cyclotron is a very compact kind of actually cyclotron, which give the continuous beam, all protons have fixed energy, low current and very compact. So these are the three modalities which are using by different vendors. Okay. So the vendor which we are using, they are using the synchro cyclotron. So cyclotron, IBA variant vendors they are using and the cyclotron need additional energy selection system because there is no energy selection system. It gives you only one fixed energy. Then you can vary the energy by using the additional energy selection system. Whereas Hitachi is using the synchrotron. The synchrotron issue is because it requires a lot of space because it requires a big circle, big ring, which actually the, accelerator, the proton accelerate in it and then get out from, the, from this uh, ring in order to uh, give energy. So that's why it generate a desired proton. It does not require, can you remove this one from the, from the users? <clears throat> Okay, so the, the, then the next one is the synchro cyclotron, which is a Mavian machine. What they did, they actually used the synchro accelerator, so I, I'm sorry, the cyclotron attached with the gantry. So it's a bi-level kind of uh, machine. So that's why it does not require a very, very actually large area. You, you have only a, you can say one room treatment just like the conventional machines. So the the cyclotron is attached to the gantry itself. So as the gantry moves, the cyclotron moves. So that's the Mavian machine. That also needs an additional energy selection system because it delivers only one big energy. So these the cyclotron have energy fixed at 250 MeV maximum. So the energy selection systems is used by the carbon double wedge at just beam energy. Maximum energy is 250 MeV and minimum energy is 70 MeV. So you can actually start from 250 to 70 so it can vary those energies. So let's look at what is where we are right now. Okay. So why we are doing all this work? Let's take a second to center ourselves and regain our focus. We are all after the same goal. What is the goal? Ultimate goal is, to, is the better patient treatments. Motivation for improvement is disease control and improving quality of life. Deliver more effective dose to the target volume while reducing dose to the normal healthy tissue that doesn't need to be irradiated. That's the goal for everyone, whether you are using conventional or you, you are using any high charge particle accelerator. In terms of avoiding sequelae in irradiated normal tissue, Robin and Kassart demonstrated that there is no safe radiation dose. Okay. So to address this problem, there has been a tremendous response from medical and scientific fields non-stop ongoing research to develop and advance new technologies and new techniques in the radiation therapy. So there is no end, okay? So this will give you, this slide will give you a little bit flavor that one modality over the other, advantage of one modality over the other. For example, if you see on my left side of the screen on the top, this is the 3D CRT and you see the lung is uh, more irradiated and heart is irradiated, at least we are using three, three field plan. And if we are using IMRT, maybe four, uh, five field plan or seven field plan. So you will see lung and heart is uh, reduced than the uh, 3D CRT, but even though there is a more actually the lung and heart is treated. So if you, you are using VMAT, VMAT is a very good technique and you can spare a lot of normal tissue as well. So you will see that the lung and heart are 
reduced so you you, um, you you will actually less radiated lung and heart there is a technique in the proton is called the passive proton therapy which is the old kind of therapy and which is still going on but if you are using they have to use two fields in order to treat this tumor but even though the lung and the heart is getting the some some part of a radiation but it is less as compared to the others but if you are using the pencil beam scanning which is right now is booming so the lung and heart is very little radiation you can treat this one is with the single field you don't need to combine the field in order to cover the tumor so in fact from the 3d crt to the pencil beam scanning the lung and heart is significantly reduced from 56 to 67% so it means in order to unnecessary irradiation, a general rule is the integral dose delivered to the patient will be two to three times lower with the protons when compared to the X-rays delivered by intensity modulated radiotherapy, mean IMRT. Possibly even more important is that a significant portion of this dose sparing can and does occur in adjacent at risk, which is the OARs. We try to actually avoid the dose to that. So let's look at some proton techniques, treatment techniques, how we can do it in order to reduce the dose to the, to the normal structure and give the dose to the tumor. So let's take a look how we can go where we are right now. So the principles of the proton therapy, you know that the X-ray generator proton beams nearly a monoenergetic Bragg peak with few millimeter in size, small lateral dimension, field width at heart, half maximum will be less than or equal to one cm, small angular divergence. For a clinical use, need, uh, use need to spread the dose laterally and longitudinally. So in order to do a clinical dose distribution, what you need, you need to spread over the dose along the path, along the beam path and away from the beam path. So there are three different techniques are used. One is the passive scattering. That technique is the old technique and used for decades. Uniform scanning, newer technique as compared to the passive scanning, passive scattering. But the latest one is the newest technology is the pencil beam scanning, okay? So we will actually cover first the passive scattering or the classification, classic proton therapy, and then we move on to the proton just give you an introduction or just give you the idea how we can use the proton in order to treat in the form of a passive scattering so the if you look at the passive scattering is the delivery method referred to by the phrase traditional or classical proton therapy think of this as the exclusive method used from the beginning of proton therapy until 1996 still in use today by many operating proton therapy centers. If you see that this is the proton beam and this is tumor we want to actually cover, this is our target. If you have just a proton beam, it is a very thin beam and it will pass through this one. So we cannot cover this one with this size of the beam, the target. What we will do, we will put a single scatter in between in order to put a single scatter, what will happen? It will broaden the beam. So any cyclotron or synchrotron is used to accelerate the proton to therapeutic energies range, typically, as I told, 70 to 250 MeV. So the proton beam exits in a narrow monoenergetic uh, state. A modular is a modulator is used or this single scatter is used to bring the narrow monoenergetic proton beam to the desired energy. So if you put a double scatter, if you look at the previous one, so even though you broaden the beam, but it is not covered the enough uh, target. And second thing is it deposits the energy at the distal edge of the tumor. So the tumor is not getting that energy, but, but it is required, okay? So if you put a double scatter, so in that uh, <clears throat> way, what you can do, you can broaden the more beam. So it means 
if you put this double scatter, so the coverage of the tumor in the lateral side is not a problem. But what happened, see still, you are not having the maximum energy at the distal edge of the tumor. So it means that the tumor is getting a very low dose. Okay. And Dr. Brar, yeah. here, here we have a question from a participant. It's a non-clinical question. He's asking that this scatter may not be activated. Yeah, it will activate it. There is a scatter which actually, that's the problem with the, with the proton. There is a scatter as well. So as we go down in the in the spot size, I will explain you what the scatter play a role. Okay. All right. So in order to actually adjust this this part, this 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 distal edge, right? So we need to bring this this brag peak at the edge of the distal edge of the target. What we do, we put a we adjust the proton energy. Right. If we adjust the proton energy, this Bragg peak will deposit at the distal edge of the tumor. So what we will do, we are adjusting more energy, putting the aperture in it. So the, but still, there is a big depth around the lateral part of the tumor. So we can reduce that depth by putting the aperture in it. So now you see that when we put an aperture in between the scatter, and the and the beam. So what we did, what we did, we actually reduced the now the lateral part of the scatter beam. But still, we we have some part of the tumor which is still cold, right? So those scatters are made of uh, this uh, this uh, brass. I will explain you later. So there is a Bragg peak which is actually all protons still have same energy stop at the same edge but still there is a there is a need to actually give more dose at the at proximal part of the tumor so what we do we put a range modulator wheel in between the beam before the scatter so what it does it will actually reduce the energy right so it will give you a different modulated energy now so the maximum energy and the minimum energy. So we have a different energies now. So some <laughs> the proton will deposit the deposit the whole dose at the edge, right? At the Bragg peak. So we reduce the Bragg peak. So that's the reduction is called the spread of the Bragg peak. When we do the spread of the Bragg peak, we will actually cover the whole tumor. So this is the wheel, okay. But the problem with this passive scattering is still there. We can adjust by putting some, some compensators and these compensators are used in the past in, in conventional treatments as well in order to actually give the shape of the tumor. So we can put the compensator close to the patient what will does it, it does the it actually conform the shape of the Bragg peak to the tumor, but the problem is still with the passive scattering. You can conform the conform the dose to the distal edge, but you cannot conform the dose to the proximal edge. So there is a problem with the conformation conform, conformity dose to the proximal edge. This is the problem with the passive scattering. So this is kind of whole picture. Let's uh, go one slide more. I will explain you this one. If you look at, I explain you, this one is the proton beam and then we have a modulator in between, then we have a scatter, right? So the scatter basically, that is the energy specific beam now, passed through on one or two scattering devices, right? This expands the narrow beam into a wide beam. Multiple beams of, uh, then we have a multiple beams, right? With the multiple energies, which are passing through the scatter. So multiple beams of various discrete energies are selected for treatment. The cumulative effect of treating with all of these beams is the creation of a Bragg peak, a spread of, of the Bragg peak. So what, um, then, in order to collimate a custom target specific beam specific aperture collimator is placed between the wide 
monoenergetic beam and the patient, usually made of thick brass, used the shape to the proton beam laterally. And then we can actually put the compensators after that. The compensator is, a, is placed perpendicular to the beam line in front of a patient, generally, generally but not always, used to shape distally, right? So the, the conform maximum therapeutic dose to the distal along the edge of the tumor, but it is not conformal at the proximal of the tumor. So what is the good of the, of the passive scattering? The good part of the uh, passive scattering is because it is used since a long time. It is a reliable technology. Field dose is delivered fast and simultaneously relatively robust against motion. Using multiple fields can mitigate lack of proximal dose conformity patches. Uh, conformity patches, for example, if you're treating this tumor, this is a target area. You can give one beam through this uh, angle and the other beam through that angle and those beams can match at a patch line. So this is very good in order to give a patch line. So you can spare the normal tissue. So the more clinical proton data is based on the passive scattering. That's why this RB is having an issue right now because the data is available, but that data is available with the scattering beam. So that's why the pencil beam is more, the people are start using the random trial by using the pencil beam. So that scatter is less as compared to, the, as compared to this uh, uh, passive scattering. The dis disadvantage is, as I showed you in the previous slide, lack of the proximal dose conformity. No intensity modulated. You cannot do the intensity modulator. You just give the energy. Need patient-specific hardware, one compensator, one aperture per field. Okay. So this is again a few, uh, uh, the beam point of view. For example, if this is a proton beam and there is no compensator in between, what will happen, all the proton is deposited to the beam, but then there is no conformity on any side. And if you put a compensator in between, which actually shape the dose distally, so compensate of the inhomogeneities as well, provides no proximal conformity, scattered from RC cause hot and cold spot in the distribution. So the workflow is, this is a very busy slide. I'm sorry if it is very small. Can be very labor intensive forward planning technique. Imagine when you are doing very complex 3D CRT. Determine and create appropriate beam angles. This is another issue. Beam specific range and modulated uncertainty calculations. Create beam specific aperture. Create beam specific range compensators. Calculate dose. Analyze lateral target margin, edit apertures, analyze lateral target margin, repeat edits if necessary, analyze beam again, specific distal and proximal target coverage, adjust range and mod input and recalculate those if necessary, analyze distal target conformity and target coverage uniformity. Manually edit all those things. Uh, edit range compensators to eliminate old and hard and cold spots in target coverage. Recalculate those, repeat, repeat, repeat. This could go on for hours. Analyze beam specific distal target. There is a potential that you could have ruined the distal target margin with your manual edit to the target compensator. It happened. If so, start over from the beginning. I repeat this process for a, every beam analyze the composite plan dose, return to the individual beams and repeat above steps to ensure plan meets clinical dose. This can become even more complicated by complex planning schemes such as match line, dose escalation, match, match and patch. This will be a very laborious job. This is a very time consuming, physics time consuming job. So that's why the, the, there was no actually interest Brought on with the passive, but unfortunately, there is a passive scattering 
there is a lot of disadvantage there is a lot of advantages but there are some disadvantages as well so we'll go over so we will see where we are right now and where we are going so what is the pencil beam scanning let's have a quick overview of the pencil beam scanning so the pencil beam scanning is the spot scanning technique so the proton beam is a pencil beam they which has a spot size equal to 4 mm feed width at half maximum is 9.5 when i say that the pencil beam is 4 mm that's uh, the maximum energy but you can actually vary the energy and you can change the spot size so the spot size if you say ultra fine is 7 mm and you can change to the fine point to the 12 mm so you can changing the energy changing the spot size so you can it depends on the tumor or the coverage and this spot size this uh, pencil beam spot size technique you can use in order to do the imrt or modulator planning as well so how does it work it work in a i i will show you on the on the ct slices as well but give you a little bit background how it works if you have a layer one so treat a layer by layer so the what, what will happen this is the first layer and uh, when you have a spot size so it drop all the spots of higher highest photon beams at the distal edge of the tumor and then put a, another layer so which actually with the, the first layer is high proton energy the second layer is reduced proton energy and then go on and then what will happen scan beam based on across the axial plane using magnet to paint it paint it layers so basically what will happen if you look at this one the pencil beam precisely placing numerous pencil beams okay i'll show you in the in the form of a uh, the planning how we are doing the planning so what will happen scan the pencil beam across target first layer and you will see it will deposit the maximum beam at the edge and then put another layer after the repeating and about 20 layers you will see you will cover whole tumor right so uh, if you are actually comparing the passive scattering and the pencil beam so what will happen the pencil the passive scattering is delivering the 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 dose to the to the tumor not in this in the form of a, a spots but in the form of a range so it will actually give one range second so you can change the range but it will actually give deliver more dose to the proximal edge of the tumor whereas the pencil beam scanning you can actually give give it spots so you can reduce the dose to the distal edge of the tumor so you can have a conformal distal edge as well uh dr rashid there are two questions related to your current slides mm -hmm. uh, the first is that in terms of the treatment uh, total time the typical time compared to the passive treatment time is there any difference what's the difference the difference uh, it depends on the because nowadays the pencil beam scanning is just doing the kind of imrt right so the treatment time is longer in the pencil beam scanning as compared to the passive scattering passive scattering scanning the reason is in the passive you are just uh, delivering the beam so there is no actually time consuming there is no kind of mlc in between so it deliver the beam right away so the time is quicker in the passive scattering as compared to the pencil beam scanning because now the pencil beam scanning is uh, using the term just like imrt is called the impt so it require more time because now the 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 the, uh, the the field is modulating when the field is modulating it actually require more time sir but also we are using uh, those compensators so are they not reducing the dose rate as well i mean it actually because that's you calculate before when you are doing the planning in order to actually do the compensator so that's done before the planning but when you are doing the treatment treatment is quicker 
Okay, there is another question. There, there, is, a, uh, there is a lot of uh, labor work from the physics point of view in order to create and generate those compensators. And those compensators are mostly, most machines are not uh, in the center. They are outside the center. There is outside vendors who are doing those compensators. So you need to do a plan and then send your plan to them. They create a compensators and then send it to you. But Loma Linda is, is the old center so they are making their compensators in house. All right. So there is a second question related to the pencil beam scanning that uh, the Amir Khatak is asking, why we move from high energy to low energy? Why not from low to high energy? The reason is because uh, the, when, when, the, when the proton is giving a energy, right? So we need to actually, I will show you uh, the proton plans we cannot actually give the um, uh, beam from any direction. We have to actually look from which direction we are delivering the, those. So we always actually in the proton, always try to give the dose to the distal edge first and then go to the proximal edge, okay? In order to, because we, we know that it will not, there will not be any exit dose from there, right? In order to cover the distal edge, we have to give a high energy first, and then we are coming, reducing the dose. So we need to reduce the dose to the normal structure, which are coming in the path of the beam. That's why we always start with the maximum energy first and then come down. I will show you in the next slides uh, about how we are planning a prostate uh, slice by slice, okay? Any more question? No, sir, so far. Okay. So the, the, um, uh, the, let's go over. This is, a, I just put an, a, a slide over here just to show you as compared to the IMRT. So intensity modulated proton therapy can be done by using allow to vary the weighting MUs for each spot. Whereas it is, it cannot be happen, it cannot be done with the passive scattering. So what will happen? Let me show you this slide as well. So what will happen when we are sending the beam, proton beam, so there is a, uh, the magnets uh, over here, which are actually making that beam uh, as, a, as, a, as a compensators, right? So those are uh, dipole magnets actually that accelerate the beam and give the spots. So we are uh, doing the layer by layer. For example, just like the beam is passing to the scanning magnet, Scanning magnet is giving a different energies, higher energy first, and then next layer is the lower energy, next layer is the lower energy, in order to cover the tumor. So we will cover the whole tumor. So it means that just like uh, if you have onions, just like the layers of the onion, the pencil beam scanning plans are like onions. So it has different layers. This will actually explain what I meant by the spot, uh, pencil beam spot size or it's pencil beam spots. So you know that precisely placing numerous pencil beams or proton particles into the target in order to cover the 3D volume of the tumor with a uniform dose distribution. First, what you do, range depends depth on the beam energy Scanning magnet or just the pencil beam, both in X and Y direction. The 3D volume is divided into several slices, layers, right? Perpendicular to the beam, center beam of the axis, just like as I showed you over here, it is a 3D kind of, right? So it actually delivered the beam to the, to the different layers. So the dose in each layer is delivered by controlling simultaneously simultaneously the pencil beam intensity and the location of the pencil beam spot in X and Y direction. How it works, the cyclo cyclotron or cyclotron is used to accelerate the proton in therapeutic range. And we know that the series of process of are performed to create a mono-energetic beam of a desired energy from 70 to 250 MeV. So then you place a magnet in between this one, this is a scanning magnet, in order to shape and steer the proton beam through the transport system and to treat the room and ultimately to the patient. So the proton beam, which is exiting, 
the transport system is a pencil beam. When it is going out from this magnet, scanning magnet, it is a pencil beam. So what is the pencil beam? Pencil beam is a narrow controlled beam of proton particles, shape and con controlled and magnet, spots, just like this, okay? So what will happen is a collection of monoenergetic proton pencil beams that are deposited at a given positions. Steering magnets uh, precisely guide pencil beam to a predetermined position in the target. For each beam, the 3D target volume is divided into several slice layers. Each layer is a collection of monoenergetic various energies. So for example, if I have this slice. Uh, sir, there is, a, there, is, there is a question related to you. Um, Muhammad Kamran, he's asking that, do you mean that these magnetic fields are changing the energy, controlling the energy? Which is not, I mean, they are just deflecting the, the beam, right? Yeah, this is just so deflecting and making a pencil beam. For the energy, oh, right. energy we have a wheel, okay? Rotational oh, wheel, right. I showed you in the previous slides. Go, should, should I go back to that slide? No, no, it's, I think the question has been answered, but he was misunderstood that it's just the scanning. It's changing okay. the direction, not the energy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So in order to cover this prostate, for example, target, if we consider this is a first layer. So for example, I created in the, in the clinic in order to show you, this is the energy which is using in order to cover the depth of this tumor. So the weight of this relative weight of this, because we are changing the weight in order to cover the tumor, right? At different layers. You see, if it deposited the, the spot, it will give the energy or it will give the coverage to the distal part. So for that, what I need, I need about a couple of uh, spots in order to cover that area, right? So this is my first layer. Then I put a second layer. So in the second layer, what I did, I actually changed the energy, right? So energy now is instead of 188, I put a 185.4 MeV and I also change the weight. So when I change the weight, this is the single so layer for this energy for the layer two, right? But if you look at the composite between the layer one and layer two, you see it could deliver more beam, more beam on this, the distal part of the tumor. And if you have a third layer, so third layer, I change the energy from 180, you know, is 181 and increase the weight because I need to cover more tumor side, right? So this is the single layer with this energy and now this has composite, okay? So, but if you see on the, on the right of the tumor in the 3D view, so the, these spots are also vary, okay? So large spot diameter equal higher spot weight, which is MU per fraction. So visual spot sizes are, are changing. So small spot mean the small weight and the large spot mean the large weight, okay? It depends on the, how many MUs per fraction is delivered, okay? So in order that I can actually deliver a dose to the, in three layers, I can deliver a dose to the, to the distal edge. And if I'm going to the fourth layer, if, I, if the fourth layer is individual one, you see it delivered the dose on, on some of the interior part and some of the posterior part of the tumor. But if you see the composite one, it delivered the dose to the distal part better. Now layer five, changing the energy and weighting because I need to put a more weight on it because I need to cover the more tumor. So layer six, individual layer, where it is putting the dose, right? But if it is a composite one, it is a covering more tumor. Then layer seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, right? If I put 15 layers, I cover most part of the tumor, right? But you, this, this is the low energy, but this is better actually coverage of the tumor. This I created just to show you. So this one is the layer, layer 15. If you look at the individual layer where it deposit the brag peak, right? 
So, but in the composite one, you will see how it covers the whole tumor. Sir, just a quick question. This can be done through the inverse planning for the yeah, photon, right? It's not, yeah. That's the inverse planning. Yeah, oh, all right, thanks. Okay. I'll go over the inverse planning plans in the later slides. Okay. Any question? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Let's look at the, uh, the comparison between the uh, passive scanning and the pencil beam scanning. Let's look at what are the pros and cons of this technique. A brief comparison of the dose distribution. So the passive scattering advantage is very sharp. Lateral penumbra due to use of the aperture. Potentially more robust for motion mitigation. Some techniques deliver the entire SOBP at once, only one field. But disadvantage is unall unable to conform dose to the target proximity. Increased treatment time in, in that way. Uh, I should not put that in increased treatment time. Increase the planning time as well as the physics time. Okay, Treatment time is less and can be very uh, erroneous. The treatment time in that way, the, the therapist has to go inside the room and put the compensators, remove the compensators if they are using more than one, one beam. So they have to go in the room twice, adjust those apertures and put those apertures. And those apertures are not actually, are the compensators not, not, a, not a lightweight. Those are very heavy because some are made of uh, brass. Brass material is very heavy as well. Okay, so it's a, the time, increasing the time in that way that the therapist has to go into inside the room for a couple of times. But in order to uh, giving the, delivering the beam is quicker than the passive, than the, than the pencil beam. So pencil beam scanning advantage is robust optimization, superior dose distribution as compared to the passive scattering, decreased dose to the normal tissue, generate reduction of the side effects, increased conformity, increased uniformity in the target coverage, decreased hot spots. That's the problem with the passive scanning. Sometimes it, it is very hard to actually reduce the hot spots. Remove of manual junctions or feathering, decrease, uh, decrease number of beams. You can do only two beams or three beams. Three beams maximum, most plans are two beams. Faster turnaround time from CT sim to treatment, decreased treatment time in order to reduce the time in order to go into the room. Very easy to implement SIB. You can do the SIB with this one because you can use the variables part weighting conducive to the to use of templates and scripting. There is a lot of scripting available now in the in the planning system. So you can whether you are using the variant plan or you are using the ray search plan. So there is a lot of scripting available now. Disadvantages, QA can be more intensive and challenging just like IMRT. Increased lateral pen, pen number as compared to the PS because you are using some scatter in between. This is likely to change in the future by planning PBS with the purchase. Comparison for the cardoma treatment, which is a base of skull. If you are using pass, pa, passive scattering, you need a 10 to 12 fields. 18 to 24 unique treatment devices, of, of, of main compensators, apertures required, difficult patch field technique, estimated 12 to 16 hours average proton dosimetries, completion time dictated by manual match line, optimization speed, you need to go inside the room, put the apertures or compensators. Whereas the PBS is just a three field, no unique treatment devices required. Estimated four to six hours for average proton dosimetrist. Completion nowadays is even less, two hours. Okay. Completion time dictated by TPS optimizer uh, calculation speed. Another adult craniospinal eight field with the PS, whereas PBS you need only three fields. Okay. No unique treatment devices required. Estimate two to four hours for average proton dosimetrist, whereas a very long time required from the 12 to 16 hours for average proton dosimetrist. But time is one to 
point one uh, one to one and a half hours. The reason is only for the matching as well as for the for those actually aperture and compensators uh, putting in the field. Whereas PVS is treatment time is half hour. If there is no matching line in the in the in the PBS in the PS, this that will be quicker. But the, the there is a less time required from the PA, from the therapist to go inside the room and matching. So that's why it required a less time. So basically, if you put together the the, the passive scattering best for smaller contagious uh, targets limits planning to approximately less than 50% of disease sites have to come up with very complicated interact techniques to overcome shortcomings, whereas pencil beam scanning can treat 70 to 80% of the disease site, even more. Large treatment field size, 40 to 30 field, because there is no, no reductions from the compensators or from the, from the apertures. So large treatment field size can be done with the PBS. So non-contagious target within same field, simple robust match line junctions, SIB, MF4, robust optimization. So there is a lot of advantages and there is a lot of actually vendor inputs in it as well because there's a lot of research as well as the innovations are going on. So let's look at the treatment planning techniques, how we can plan a better with the with the first couple of slides, which are comparing the passive scanning and the PBS. For example, if we are treating this uh, liver tumor, so for the PBS, you need actually uh, two fields as well, but you see there is less hard spot over here if you as compared to the, to the passive scanning. So in both, uh, uh, the the weightings are RAO is 60 and LAO is 40%. The weightings on both is same, but just giving you an uh, idea that how much is the difference. So here is the subtraction between the PBS and the and the and the passive scanning. So uniform scanning or the passive scanning plan is 18 to 21 centigrade hotter in this area. All right as compared to um, if you are comparing both plans. So the uniform scanning plan is basically or the PSA's plan is eight to 12 centigrade harder in this region. So it, if you're using the uniform scanning or the passive scanning, so the, the, there is a harder area as compared to the PBS. If you are looking at uh, one beam plan, so one beam plan also compared, there is a lot of hot spots over here as compared to the best, the PBS. If you subtract it, you will see the difference by looking at the single beams. So this is also a very good example in order to see, in order to treat a Erving sarcoma in the femoral head. So you see, this is the one field plan with the passive scanning, okay. So this is a three field plan with the passive scanning. Same plan with the S uh, with non IMRT kind of, okay. So you see how the dose is distributed. There's a low dose in this area. There's a low dose over here, oh, sorry. Sorry, give me a little second. I need to check my battery. I'm sorry. Okay. 
So I was sitting on the recliner and when I pull it, so it pulled the power cable. So if you actually compare this single field, so the, the, there's a less dose with the three field as compared to the single field. But if you're doing the IMPT using the, uh, the pencil beam scanning, you will see there is a very less dose around the, around the, um, uh, around the femoral head. But if you're using three field, you can cover the tumor very well, but there's still, there is a very low dose around the, femoral head as compared to the single uh, passive scanning. So what is the D, big deal? The deal is with the pencil beam scanning, putting proton therapy on par with the IMRT. So you can compare the proton therapy as the IMRT. Ability to inverse planning, robust optimization, you can do the dose escalation like SIB plans. Low, low, low production cost because there is no cost for uh, the compensators, no cost for the apertures. Okay, so fast delivery as compared to the passive scanning, ten to fifteen minutes treatment slot. We are done. We are doing about uh, twenty or twenty-two patients per day on one machine on our machine. We have only one machine starting seven o'clock, the physics uh, start the warming up the machine at seven o'clock. So the first patient is eight o'clock and we are done on around five o'clock, about 22 to 23 patients. And those in our center, there is not, uh, there, those patients are not a, just like a uh, bread and butter. Those are very complicated cases come to our center. So because we are the first who started the cyber knife as well. So we have a lot of radio surgery patients. So the patients come from all over the USA to our center. So the same, uh, the patients are coming. We give the option to the patient for the proton as well. So we are having a very big load. So around uh, 22 to 25 patients per day. So treating 22 to 25 patients on proton machine is a is a lot of lot of patient slots. So we deliver about 10 to 15 minutes uh, patient treatment. We are using the IGRD as well as the treatment. So like uh, intensity modulated proton therapy, here we will define and make sure we understand what is implied by some common or commonly misunderstood terms as such as IMPT, PBS, SFO, SFUD, and F F MFO. The people are using different terminologies in order to deliver a plan. But every plan is basically, nowadays is modulated plan by doing at our machine. But the, the, the other machines are, they, if they need to do the IM, IMPT, they need to use some compensators in between. Okay. So let me give you some examples, the planning examples. So the clinical uh, PBS example that excite me most, for example, comparing the, uh, the, uh, the chest wall, if you're using a single field optimization, so which is robust optimization, single plan and paper. Yeah. Any question? No, no, sir. I think someone has unmuted his mic. Okay. So if you look at the 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 field that the, how the how the proton actually treat the NFAS, right? So there is no very little dose to the to the lung, and more dose actually depositors at the chest wall, which is very difficult by doing this kind of plan or this kind of treatment with the conventional uh, photons. So you see the, uh, this is a composite plan of 60-40. And if you look at uh, maximum dose is delivered to the esophagus, um, the, the, the zero volume, zero percent, right? Even though the, uh, the 45 degree, 45 centigrade, heart is getting very low dose, 200 centigrade. 
So lung is uh, having very low dose, it's 20% of the lung at 20 centigrade, which is this value is giving 14.79. So these are, if you look at the DVH uh, histogram, so you will see that uh, the tar target as well as the normal structures are lung and heart are getting very low dose. And Dr. Abra, there is a there is a question regarding Dr. the imaging model. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, there is a question regarding the imaging modality used for CT simulation. Is it the only CT or for proton planning? There is another modality. Planning you is fuse. CT based planning, but you can fuse the in the planning. You can fuse MRI. You can fuse uh, PET scan and then continue on it. And then the planning is the CT planning. Okay. I will go in the okay. next, after this uh, planning uh, technique, I'll go on some uncertainties and then show you how we can use the CT. So the, the for the proton, we are not using the Hounds units, but what we are using, we are using a stopping power ratio. Okay. So how- I think that's the reason it? that uh, some people are asking that. What is that? Some people are asking, they are confused with the, the CT. You are showing the CT images, so they might think in, in Proton, we are not using the house field units. So how we can incorporate that? So I think you answered. So I will explain topic. you in the next couple of, so when I am doing the next uh, slide, next slides. So in the, uh, under the uncertainties, I will show you how we convert this Hounds unit right. to be for using in the Proton. All right. So this slide is an example of a Hodgkin plans. So here is the example with an interior beam that is passing through, that is used to spare the heart, right? As well as a lot of lung compared to the, to the photon. So you see, this is a single beam. So you can treat the Hodgkin disease in order to spare the heart as well as the lung. So this is a lung treatment. So for lung cases, the posterior beam is usually used Okay, so in order to treat the lung. So the, uh, the most stable as far as setup and heterogeneity is, and then we could combine the posterior field with another field that come off the cord to control the cord. For example, if we need to actually cover this area, right? So we need to actually deliver a less beam to the, to the, to the cord. So we can use one posterior beam and if the tumor is not covered, we can give the lateral beam and we know that it will stop at the, at the distal edge of the tumor. So we can use some anterior oblique field, which can actually interior uh, right uh, um, RAO field in order to cover this tumor. Usually we use one single field in order to cover a lung tumors. For the, for the abdominal posterior right, uh, posterior and right side, right? So there is a field, two fields are using, are the most common and st stable beam. They are the most reproducible beams. And what we are trying to do is to avoid all the bowel and gas, which are, which are very actually, um, uh, very problematic in the abdominal treatment, which are very variable as well. However, in using the posterior and right side beam, we had to manage the amount of liver and kidney dose because the beam is coming from the, from the liver side as well as from the kidney. So we need to actually manage the kidney and the liver doses. The pelvis is also a very actually uh, treatment site which we is using in the, in the proton in our center. So depending on the target geometry, lateral or posterior beams are most reproducible. And advantages of reducing the um, organ at risk dose, anterior beam should be avoided. The reason is non-reproducible bladder volume because sometimes the bladder is filled, sometimes the bladder is empty. Bowel gas causes uncertainty. So then endorectal balloon can improve the geometry or reproducibility of the rectum. So this is how we do with the, with the pelvis plan. So we use the posterior beams mostly. This 
a very famous uh, field matching in the, the pencil beam scanning. We are going to review some clinical examples which are very interesting to all of you. We do with the proton. One of these interesting thing is the field matching technique we use in cases such as craniospinal, head neck, and where we match beams from different directions. The way we create a robust match is by overlapping by overlapping our fields of several centimeters and creating the gradient fall off where we match the field. On this top left figure, you can see the brain match brain field and on the right side profile across the plane <coughs> where the brain would be matching the upper spine. Right? This one is upper spine, it is matching with the upper spine. In the lower left side image, we can see don't have the hard spot that we typically see with photon match plans where we normally have to feather. We are able to create a very uniform dose as shown in the lower right panel right, by compensating the upper and lower spinal field of each other and using a very shallow gradient. You see a very shallow gradient where those fields are matching. So the, in this slide, you will see the, there are some examples of different sites where we would use the shallow gradient technique. We use it craniospinal as you have seen. We also use it uh, in sarcomas that are too large to fit in a single field. We also use it in head, head and neck cases where we need to match the superior posterior field with the interior uh, inferior fields. Finally, we also use it in whole pelvis, right? prostate treatment where we want to treat the nodes with the posterior, posterior beam to spread everything in front as we want to use lateral beam lower down to the spare the rectum. Okay. Retreatment is also is a proton provides the potential to retreat recurrences while avoiding even low doses to the previously irradiated normal tissue. We see a lot of retreatment here at uh, Georgetown. On the left panel is an example of a patient we treated with photon initially with the dose of around 60 gray. Her brain dose, brainstem doses were maxed out and then she returned a couple of years after needing craniospinal radiation. So using multi-field optimization, we were able to give almost zero dose to the brainstem to the area of the tissue that was maxed out previously, which, has, which is something can't be achieved with the photon treatment. I think you will actually appreciate this one. With the PBS, there is also a very advantage, uh, another unique advantage that we are able to do with the pencil beam scanning to, is to avoid treatment targets, treating the targets that contain metal while avoiding a lot of uncertainties involved in sending the beam through the metal. This is an example of breast patient with a metal core with her expander. Okay, if you see that. So that metal core, basically we want, we are, we are, we are able to do to create an individual target that restricts spots from passing through and then use multi-field optimization to conform the beam around the target. So you see that we can conform the beam around the, around the, this, uh, <clears throat> this is an example of the photon IMRD and comparison. Oh, let's go over because quickly. So what is the difference between planning photon and proton? In proton, no exit dose, greater freedom in choice of the beam directions, Vertex field used to create a, a to greater effect, for example, brainstem, base of, base of skull. This is a very good example of acoustic neuroma. Another uh, advantage is uh, we can use a single uniform beam, SOBP, uniform dose to the target, not restricted to the coplanar need parallel opposed pairs of beams. Fewer beams required acceptable plan for example, one field field for paravertebral sarcoma. 
So lack of skin sparing, a wide beam directing passing, uh, passing through the shallow sensitive structures can improve including some gamma components. Variety of different beam del delivery operators, accelerator, synchrotron, cyclotron, beam delivery system, double scattering, pencil beam scanning, IMPT. There is a lot of other high sensitivity to the heterogen ITs. As you see, affect the range along the beam axis. So what we do, we avoid that if they, it is passing through the high dense area, but sometimes it is unavoidable. So then there is some restrictions I will show you in the next slides. So this uncertainty is in the proton therapy is a very hot topic. So there is a lot of uncertainties. Okay. So how we go overcome? Uh, we know that those are the uncertainties and how we adjust them. So the first uncertainty is the range uncertainties, which is very common. The uncertainty is, for example, the, the, beam, the, the beam energy which is coming out is not always uh, uh, stop at the same position. So there is a, always there is a plus minus where it stop. So the uncertainty in knowing exactly where the beam, the back, back peak occur in the patient. So proton plan or robustness, so ensuring adequate target coverage, even under range and geometries uncertainties. Even though robustness and uncertainties are very extensive topic in the proton, it may not cover everything in this talk, it required a separate talk for that. For the sake of time and focus of this presentation, I'm taking only uh, liberties and take uh, great uh, simplifying these topics. So just go over those topics very quickly. So due to the range struggling, not always proton, all protons of the same energy have the same range. Thus uh, range needs to be defined for a beam of proton resulting in the broad Bragg peak or spread out of Bragg peak. So what is that? Proton range means the position where the proton has uh, dose has decreased to 80% of the maximum dose. For monoenergetic beam, 50% of proton stopped at 80% dose fall off. So for example, if we are treating this tumor, if you see this is the Bragg peak, so 80% of the beam is at the Bragg peak, but some of the beam is going outside the tumor. Okay, actually most placing using 90% of the maximum dose in order to treat this kind of tumor. So the range uncertainty, what usually the centers are using is 3.5% of the range. So then the next uncertainty is the RBE uncertainty at the end of the range. So sensitivity, it is also sensitive to the anatomical range changes. For example, if we are using a different uncertainties, so if I put the uncertainty to the negative 3.5%, how it affect the tumor, okay? If I put the 3.5, you will see it is a better coverage of the tumor if I'm putting 3.5% uncertainty in it. If I put no uncertainty in it, so it may deliver a dose outside the tumor too much, okay? So those are the disadvantages or the advantages of using the Brad Peak. So there is an uncertainty. So what will happen in a couple of years ago, someone was published in Physi Physics Medical Journal that they publish uh, different centers are using different uncertainties. So they're using the uncertainty 3.5% plus one millimeter range, for instance, result in an overshoot of eight millimeter or 20 millimeter range field of soft tissue. So basically Loma Linda is using 3.5% plus three millimeter Emily Anderson is using the same range. U U University of Pennsylvania is using the same range. We are at uh, MGH, we are using 3.5% one millimeter. University of Florida, they are 2.5% plus 1.5 millimeter. So they are doing different way, a little bit different way. But the, in order to using this range, so nowadays the the plan is so robust, it calculate the depth of the tumor and it recommend you what the range you need to use it. Okay. So then there are some heterogeneities uh, which degrade the Bragg peak. This slide show you if there is no heterogeneity in between the, in between the um, proton beam. So it deliver the Bragg peak without any degrading. 
But if there is a bone or any other material, heterogeneity material in between the plane, so what will happen? The Bragg peak is degraded. So it means in order to reduce that uncertainties, we need to actually try to send the beam away from the bone. And if it is coming out of the bone, so we know that how much dose we are delivering at, at the Bragg peak. No, it is the problem. And the system can compensate. Uh, yes. Sir, from the previous previous slide, mm -hmm. but hopefully the treatment planning systems and the algorithms are taking care of all these inhomogeneities based on that, it's calculating the effect to those effect to depth. So are they not taking care of it? I mean, all this. No, for example, uh, nowadays planning systems are taking care of. I'm just telling you that if there is any heterogeneity in between the path, it will degrade the back peak. Oh, all right. Okay. So what are the sources of uncertainties? Basically, we are now going to go through some of the sources of uncertainty. We have patient related uncertainty as we have with any modality in radiation therapy. We have patient setup uncertainties any uncertainty generated by organ motion, uncertainty in the target definition, physics related uncertainties, right? Like uh, CT number, conversion, dose calculation, which in proton the most significant uncertainty from CT number, conversion to the stopping power as well as dose related calculations. We have machine related uncertainties that are integral in our part, in our device tolerances, beam delivery method, and finally, we also have radiobiological uncertainties related to the relative biological effectiveness of the proton. These uncertainties are ultimately reflected in proton treatment plans by not knowing exactly where photons, where protons stop within the body and in the contact content of the next slide. We will actually discuss these sources of uncertainties in more detail, as well as palliative method applied to proton planning to reduce the effect. Okay. So main uncertainties which are addressed, which, we, which is main is stopping power ratio estimation, setup error and organ motions, right? So these uncertainties are ultimately reflected in pro pro proton treatment plans by not knowing where photon, protons exactly stop within the body. So let, let's look into it briefly. This is a very vast topic. It requires a one hour talk in order to do the stopping power ratio conversion. So this is a very stoichiometric stu 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 method is the technique used most widely for performing the transformation. So what it does, it convert the, um, the Hans unit with the density to the, to the stopping power ratio. So the planning CT images are currently used to derive the, the stopping power ratio distribution on the basis of predetermined linear relationship between the CT, Hans unit and SPRs. The accuracy of this calibration is critical to the accuracy of the dose calculation. This is a way important uh, in order to do a, just like a, in, the, in the conventional planning, what we do, we, we create a CT density table, right? So what we do, we, we have a phantom, CT density phantom with known densities, right? So we run through the CT and calculate the density and put those density against the house unit into the treatment planning system. But for the proton, proton cannot use the house unit it, because it, uh, the, the proton does not actually use the patient density, but it use, uh, sorry, uh, it actually stop based on the density. So that's why we need, instead of Hans units, we need a stopping power ratio, right? So what we do, we first actually scan the phantom, get the HUs, and then use the, the stoichiometric uh, calculation method in order to convert into the SPRs. So the, we generate a same table as the density table. This table is called the SPRs. Any question? Okay, so the range, uh, in the range uncertainties, next one is the motion. So as you see, the proton range variation by the respiration of the motion for the lung 
as the lung is moving, as the motion is moving, so it will actually going out of the treatment. So we can take care of as well when we are doing the uh, motion targets. Okay. So basically, what will happen? The the water equivalent tissue difference map between the max and minimum intensity injection on this slide you can see. So that that will change the from the left right to the AP direction how the beam is actually changing. So for example, if you are delivering the beam, so you see with due to the respiratory motion, so this kind of motion. So we need to take care of the motion as well when we are planning for the target. I'm not actually going in depth of the RB uncertainty and those RB uncertainty at the distal edge. Okay, so this is not the this is not the topic of this uh, talk, but you see that uh, different uh, um, uh, as you as you go to different uh, uh, Bragg peak um, energies, the biological doses is also increase. So in generic, what we are doing, we are using the RB of 1.1. So, which is recommended in ICRU report 178. So, we also avoid the beam, day to day beam. For example, if this is the original plan and this is the daily CT where we are getting, you see that the rotation of the bone reduce the range of the film. So, this is the plan what we have created. But on that, on the day of treatment, due to this bone direction, what will happen? The, the <clears throat> It degrade the, 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 so this is another uncertainty which is called the anatomic uncertainty. So one treatment plans are used, just the proton treatment planning is the same. Uh, sir, can we, can't we do the, the adaptation right there on the system I mean, during the treatment, is it? That's what, uh, that's what uh, most, some of the centers are doing. We are not doing what we are doing. We are giving the margin to the tumor at this time. Uh, all right. And we are doing the daily CT. So we have a CBCT uh -huh. in the machine, so we can take the CBCT and uh, then uh, see it how much is different from the plan. Okay. Uh, you are putting the markers as well? Yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, in photon therapy, no single field can result in a uniform dose. In proton therapy, there is a single field can generate a uniform dose. So typical proton plan, you use fewer two to three fields, use multiple fields to spread out on this, use fields to reduce. I think my talk is going on very long, so I should reduce it. Okay. It may uh, make it a little bit uh, uninterested. So let's, let me go over quickly. Okay. So yes, sir, we can... Uh, because okay. maybe there are some questions, so we can, okay. another five okay. to 10 minutes. Okay, let me go to the QA. So uh, this uh, PTV planning is the same as we do the, the conventional planning, but instead of PTV, we use in the proton, we use the CTV, okay? So why we use the CTV, I have some slides, but let's go over to the QA quickly. So, Let's avoid those slides. So this is the KV ray every every day we do the KV X-ray imaging, and uh, in order to do the plan. Okay, so this is the Mamian treatment. What we use is a single room treatment. So it has just like the ML, MLC. Okay. So the uh, you see that that's the spot size. Okay. So the, you can change as you see that the energy is. Reducing the spot size is also increased because due to the scattering, because you are putting the rotational wheel in front of it in order to reduce the range, right? So it creates a scatter. That scatter will give you a large spot size. So this is our range. We have a 70 to 227 uh, MEV. So in the quality assurance, uh, what the other modality is, what physicists do before daily operation, patient QA, regular patient QA, motion phantom QA for over delivery MEU, what is the linearity, what happened of over delivered MEUs for treatment fields. These are all done by the physicist, 
okay so most places physicists are also doing the warm up of the machine okay because this is a very unique and there is no robust kind of uh, quality assurance available so the physicists are doing the quality assurance as well for the new uh, sir is yes. there any concept of flatness and asymmetry for these kind of uh, scanning beams yeah i'm showing you okay so in the okay. morning qa includes five points one is safety check we have uh, uh, aperture in between just like i'm i'm lc so we have a, a with aperture field with mlc and with open field as well so we do the output consistency check for both fields then we do the um, check of those fields for pen number of flatness and symmetry we check this part size we check this part scanning position accuracy whether it is uh, giving at the accurate spot then we do the laser alignment kv kv match igrd accuracy check so this is the daily check for the safety so those are the working then output and scanning check consistency we are using 2d array which is called the octavius from ptw and sometime we need to use the parallel plate chamber from the wellhofer which is a pc055 which is calibrated by the calibration lab so we do the scanning characteristic we check the scanning characteristics of the field the pen number of Uh, fly, fly, uh, left and right pen number of symmetry and flatness day to day every day for both fields then we check the daily check uh, the the dose delivery and matching check we we do the spot size check for the for the two fields two energies 202 and 110 because both having having a different field size uh, the spot size then we check the range as well so the daily range check is for two different actual energies uh, two different depths one is 7.9 and 8.5 and then we match with the with the baseline so we also check the spots whether those spots are actually the layers which i showed you the spots so whether those spots are matching with each other so those spots we check with different energies one is a low energy one is the high energy so patient planning qa is also done so patient qa providing the adequate confidence of the clinical operation to identify the plan related issues delivery uh, both energies aa and field size to make sure the machine perform consistent dosimetry accuracy fail pass so physicists physicists spending a lot of time to try to eliminate the problems before the put the patient on the table so using the approved plan for delivery what we do we check the ct into water cover and plastic plate form phantom collapse all the energy beam angle to 90 and collapse all the touch angle to couch angle to 270 degree just like imrt and approved plan transfer to the pl plastic solid water phantom and then deliver it to to dra to measure the dose and uh, calculate the proximal mid and distal doses and compare them and then we see whether the plan is passed or failed okay so then we do some motion phantom as well with the for the motion tumors okay so we will see all those actually pass and fail but sometime the 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 qa is failed not the end of the world we investigate why it failed okay so then we actually try there is maybe a treatment planning error maybe a match machine related issue or maybe a human related issue so we dig all those so other unknown issues keep exploring right thank you very much uh thank you sir so any uh, there was a question i skipped because to ask at the end i think one of our colleague is asking about are we going towards the hyper fractionation in future because of the, the proton therapy the way we are giving less doses to the the normal tissues you know there is a lot of uh, pressure from the peer pressure in order to do a hypofractionations but right now everyone is a little bit scared uh, we are actually the, when the data random randomized trials are available so then we can actually go to the hypofractionation <laughs> so there is a lot of pressure for the hyperfractionation i am pretty sure it will be very soon but right now no there is no hyperfractionation right now all right thank you sir
Thank you, sir. And secondly, yeah. just a quick question. Are you doing the patient-specific quality assurance for every patient? Yes, we do for every patient. That's what I showed you over here. So we do... I mean, are you skipping after getting enough confidence, just like for IMRT? Mm -hmm. We are I mean, skipping. You know that there is a lot of uncertainties in the, in the plutonium. So that's why we are not skipping it. No, no center is skipping it. Every oh, center is oh, doing a patient-specific QI. Because as I mentioned in the previous slides, there is uncertainties. So in order to overcome those uncertainties, we are actually doing the patient-specific QI. Sometimes some Second. angle is not working. For example, if we are doing the breast, for example, the, the, sometimes the angle is not cleared, right? In order to do that, we have to do a patient QA. Oh, it's fine. And the secondly, sir, uh, another quick question from my side, that, you know, the contouring protocols regarding the, because I see the, the way the, the uncertainties you have shown us is totally different than the, the, the WPM report. So the contouring protocols are completely changed because of these uncertainties or? Yeah, the, as I showed you in the past, we are using ICRU 378, which is actually the, uh, which tells that how much margin we need to give to the GTV for the proton. Okay. Oh, so there for the protons. PT cog is also very active in order to do the, the contouring. Okay, so we are not doing, we are not generating the PTVs, we are generating the CTVs because I skipped those slides which actually require or how we are, why we are doing the CTV instead of the PTV. And for the Bragg peak, we don't need a PTV for the, because we are usually covering better the distal edges, only we are having issues with the, with the lateral edges, right? So that's uh, that can be actually handled very well with the with the changing the Bragg peak energy in order to cover that uh, uh, lateral edges as well. So that's why we don't need a, that amount of uh, expansion around the GTV as we do in the conventional treatment. For hypofractionation, you see the margin is also reduced. Only and even though now with the IGRD, the margin is not that as we used to for the 3D CRT. That's true. So if any, if any question from the participants, you can unmute your mic please and you can ask. Okay, uh, thank you. This is uh, Capi Sotieno. I'm talking from Rome, Italy. So first of all, thank you so much for this good presentation on proton therapy. So I have a couple of questions, but uh, the first one, very fast. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abar. So, if you compare Dr. 3D... Dr. Rashid, he is not Dr. Abrar. He was Kepes. Ah, okay, it's a different person. Okay, fine. Yeah. So if you compare between the passive and uh, uh, pencil vein scanning, okay, so for uh, 3D uh, CRT and IMRT, which one would you say as more, is more prone to higher uncertainties uh, in terms of planning? Uh, let me show you that slide. If I can find. My desktop is not that robust. Your question over here, right? Yes. Okay, so you see this one is a 3D CRT, right? So 3D conventional treatment. Yes. So this is IMRT. So the uh, with the with the passive scattering and the PBS, the PBS is giving you even less dose to the lung as compared to the 
the other actually modalities. Okay, thank you. Did I yes, answer your question? Uh, yes, yes, I think uh, you have answered because it is very clear. Uh, I can see there's uh, less dose to the lung uh, for the PBS. Okay, the other question is that, uh, okay, you've shown us, uh, I think, in the very last slide, uh, the uncertainty is due to the moving tumors. For example, if you have to treat something on in the lungs or let's say prostate. So uh, is there a possibility of adapting uh, the procedure or... Uh, the treatment to the moving tumors using the proton therapy or uh, you just have to expand the PTV? Right now, there is no gating for the, for the, uh, for the proton. So we are just expanding the PTV, uh, GTV, okay? But not the expansion is not like uh, the PTV, expansion is just to the, to the, to the CTV. So there is no PTV in the proton, only the CTV. Okay. Actually, I skipped those slices uh, where I... Yeah, another question. If you remember in your discussion about uh, the advantages and uh, disadvantages, so one of the advantage of the PBS, that is a proton beam, I mean, pencil beam scanning, was uh, increased lateral penumbra as compared to passive uh, scattering. Uh, but there is also somewhere that you also say that uh, with the pencil beam scanning, you can uh, actually reduce the distal edge uh, dose, the dose to the distal edge of, let's say, the tumor. So those two right. points were contrasting. Okay, let me see if I understood your question. So you are saying where I'm comparing the PBS and PS, right? Yes. Okay. Because you are... Uh, yes, right there. Okay. So what is your question? Because uh, you are cutting, so I could not understand some of the things which you asked. Can you repeat? So the, the question is, if you look at the disadvantages, uh, the last mm -hmm. one is increased lateral penumbra mm -hmm. as compared to the uh, passive scattering. Right. Uh, but, uh, but also somewhere you said that uh, using PBS, we are able to control the distal dose at the age of the tumor. You know that the distal dose uh, with the PS um, can be controlled very easily as well. But the, 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 the disadvantage of the PS is the proximal dose, not the distal dose. So in order to deliver the proximal dose with a PBS, the pen number is a little bit increased as compared to lateral increased as compared to the PS. Okay. So that's the reason that yes, uh, in the PBS, the lateral pill number is is uh, is uh, is increased as compared to the PS because in the PS you can easily control the distal edge of the tumor, but the proximal edge you cannot control. You will see a lot of dose to the proximal edge, but the, with the with the PBS. You can control the distal as well as the PB as as well as the proximal, but by doing it, the pen number is increased on both sides. Okay, uh, thank you. The last question is this: eh? uh, I think uh, in the last presentation there was a presenter also talking about uh, the uh, the proton beam therapy and uh, one of the publications that he quoted uh, in terms of toxicity if. PB, I mean, proton uh, therapy is compared to the conformal, and uh, the conformal was MRT. He was saying that uh, for a cohort of uh, some uh, patients of prostate cancer, uh, the toxicity was compared between the conformal and the proton therapy 
And what they found is that uh, there's no significant difference in terms of toxicity to the normal tissue. So I would want to ask you, what is your experience at uh, MGH? Have you ever checked on the toxicity in terms of uh, between the, these two different uh, modalities or is there some more advantages to the, uh, by using proton therapy than the, the, the conventional uh, uh, X-ray therapy? You know, I did not say that the toxicity is a different. Toxicity is way different than the proton therapy as compared to the photon therapy. The, the toxicity uh, is uh, uh, low in the proton as compared to the photon. The reason is because the there is a less dose to the to the to the. Um, Doctor Doctor Rashid. Yes. I think I, uh, let me rephrase because it was not it was Doctor Ebrar said not the toxicity actually it was the treatment outcome. It was the discussion that. Yeah. For prostate, typically that uh, the treatment outcome is almost equivalent with the, the proton therapy. That was the discussion. As, as, at this time, yes. Yeah. Because yeah. there is a, some research are going on. And I told you earlier that the, the, the prostate and any other disease, the old patients, there is not long-term actually survival, right? There is a short-term survival. But what we are looking, we are looking for the long-term survival. So the long, for the long-term survival, you will have a long, uh, you will have, for example, PEDS patient, if you're treating the pediatric patient as compared to the adult patient, so you can have a long-term survival in the PEDS patient. So there are the advantages over there because you are giving the less dose to the, to the, to the organ at risk. Second thing is, I told you the GI patients, for example. So if the, for example, pancreas patient or any liver patients, if you're treating those patients so with the 3D IMRT as compared to the hyperfractionation, hyperfractionation has a way better survival as compared to the, to the, to the conventional. But there is not much research going on right now. There is a lot of research going on, but not published yet. With the with the proton, but whatever is published based on the pro prostate, okay, the prostate is a very unique kind of, or very simple kind of anatomy. There is only two things in between the treatment plans: usually rectum and bladder, right? So uh, the there is a comparison between the IMRT as well as the IMPT. So there is a comparable. But on the other disease side, so there is a lot of, I think, benefit with the proton, but still yes, it's not published yet. Yeah, yeah. There, that's why I was clarifying that statement that uh, Dr. Abrar particularly said about the, uh, the prostate. It was not a general statement. It was very particular. So therefore, I- You I mentioned my name with Dr. Abrar. I, I love him. I, he's here. <laughs> he can. Dr. Abrar is with us. Hello, Dr. Abrar. Yeah. Maybe he's sleeping. No, no, uh, I think, no, no, he can, he can hear us now because he was muted. <laughs> okay. He's my very de dear friend. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, sir, it's too late now. Uh, yeah. Let me, let me read the, uh, the comments that everyone is saying. Uh, thank you because we have diverse participants from Australia, from East Africa, Italy, Pakistan, everyone is saying thank you so much. It was a very good presentation, it was very informative. And I thank personally you thank you for and, accepting uh, thank our you request. Yeah. Hope we and continue we might, this kind of... Uh, yes, we uh, might, uh, we might need you again, yeah. Yeah, I have a lot of experience for the stereotactic hyperfractionation, cyber knife base, so we can talk sometime from that as well. That's very, that's very good, sir. Even, even if you can uh, merge the SRS with the small field dosimetry as well, if you can merge that will be better so that we can understand the small field let's dosimetry do, at the same time. Let's do GI with a cyber knife sometime, okay? Sure, sir, sure. Yeah, so uh, everyone, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Abrar. Thank you very much.
Uh, Rahim, uh, uh, just one comment. Uh, today's talk, it was uh, brought on again, and uh, it was uh, for the sake of uh, information. I think it was very good. Uh, really appreciate you arranging all that. And uh, the next talk, uh, uh, you may find someone uh, uh, gamma knife because there is a, uh, people uh, treating gamma knife in Pakistan and Dr. Rashid and uh, gamma knife and cyber knife together one single talk can be a uh, possibility. And the other way around, it is a very nice, uh, really appreciate. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you everyone. Okay, everyone, thank you. See you next week. Thank you. Thanks.